Hi, welcome to my channel Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. Today's video is on wide complex tachycardia. And in part one, I'll be dealing with a broad overview to an approach to wide complex tachycardia and especially on the importance of knowing the relationship or rather the lack of relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes. Let's mind map today's video. Under tachyarrhythmias, we have wide complex tachycardia. Here are six questions in front of you. Now, the first two questions are general. The last four of them are the ones that you ask yourself when you have an ECG in front of you, an ECG which consists of a wide complex tachycardia and you want to differentiate whether it is ventricular tachycardia or a supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. So you will understand this further as the video progresses. What is the differential diagnosis of wide complex tachycardia? Which is to say a QRS duration of more than 120 milliseconds. Now broadly there are four causes. One is ventricular tachycardia. Second is supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. Third is supraventricular tachycardia with pre-excitation and fourth metabolic and drug causes more commonly hyperkalemia, drug toxicities secondary to type 1 antiarrhythmics and in some cases of pacemaker mediated tachycardia. Now when it comes to ventricular tachycardia it is important to know that ventricular activation in VT does not occur via the normal his Purkinje pathway. It does not occur from top to bottom like this, but rather it occurs directly through this ventricular muscle. There are re-entry circuits which are set up within the ventricular muscle. So there may be changes in the activation and repolarization sequence because of the local tissue characteristics of this muscle. So what happens is we get subtle differences in the QRS and STT waves on the ECG and this is important to note when you are studying a case of wide complex tachycardia. Now this is in contrast to supraventricular tachycardia. In SVT, regardless of where it originates, whether it comes from the SA node or from the atrial myocardium or whether it originates from the AV node, all of these impulses travel to the ventricle through this his Purkinje pathway. So the complexes which are produced on ECG are quite similar to each other. So the, those subtle differences that you see between the complexes are not seen in SVT. Whether SVT is associated or not associated with, associated with aberrancy, the general characteristics of SVT is that the complexes produced will be similar to each other. Let's talk about the differences between the mechanisms of VT versus SVT. Now in ventricular tachycardia, there is re-entry around the myocardial tissue and usually if there is a scar tissue in the myocardium secondary to myocardial infarction, then VT can set in. There are of course other causes which is seen in idiopathic ventricular tachycardias. Then we have SVT. Now SVT can occur with wide complex tachycardia through various mechanisms. Now when we talk about SVT with aberrancy, then if the baseline ECG is already having a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block, then the same block will be manifested during a supraventricular tachycardia as well and it will reflect the same kind of changes that we see in the baseline ECG. So that is one reason why SVT with aberrancy occurs. Another reason is when you have an, an ECG in the baseline which is not having any bundle branch blocks but when SVT sets in then a functional right bundle branch block or a functional left bundle branch block sets in. And why does this occur? This occurs because the refractory period of one of these branches, one of these bundles or fascicles is surpassed during the tachycardia during this supraventricular tachycardia. So when you have rapid atrial activity here in the supraventricular region and when this rapid atrial rate reaches these bundles, one of these bundles gets tired out and it blocks and that leads to a functional bundle branch block causing 
an SVT with aberrancy. Let's talk about SVT with pre-excitation. Now there are two ways in which SVT with pre-excitation can lead to wide complex tachycardia. Now when you have pre-excitation that means you have an accessory pathway that is an extra communication between the atrium and the ventricle and this is in addition to the normal communication through the AV node. Now when you have impulses in the atria and when they directly travel down this accessory pathway into the ventricle it bypasses or short circuits this AV node. So this is one way by which SVT with pre-excitation can lead to wide complex tachycardia. Now this is a bit of a dangerous situation because if the SVT is an atrial fibrillatory wave, if it's an atrial fibrillation which is conducting down the accessory pathway, then all the fibrillatory waves of the atria are hammered down onto the ventricle and that can lead to ventricular fibrillation and cardiac arrest. So it is an emergency situation especially in cases of atrial fibrillation just like how a hemodynamically unstable VT can be a dangerous situation. Now another mechanism by which SVT with pre-excitation can lead to a wide complex tachycardia is again when the SVT impulses travel down the accessory pathway and then they re-enter back into the atria retrogradely through the AV node. So a re-entry circuit is set up but in such a way that the anti-grade arm is down the accessory pathway and the retrograde arm is through the AV node. Now normally or more commonly when you have a premature atrial beat in the atrium then it will preferentially go down the AV node and there are two three reasons for it number one is that the beat may be closer to the AV node and more importantly the refractory period of this accessory pathway may be quite long may be quite high in number so when it is highly refractive then it doesn't allow impulses to come down the accessory pathway and so a premature beat or a supraventricular tachycardia will go down this AV node and then go up the accessory pathway back into the atria to set up a re-entry circuit. But in certain cases, in rarer cases, you can have an opposite direction of re-entry that is anti-gradely down the accessory pathway and retrogradely up the AV node and when this happens that means the atria to ventricular activation is abnormal. The ventricles are activated in an abnormal way through an abnormal communication through this accessory pathway. It does not occur normally as it happens via the AV node and as a result you get a wide complex which emanates from this ventricle and you get wide complex tachycardia. What is Ashman's phenomenon? Now this is quite an important phenomenon to know in order to differentiate ventricular tachycardia from SVT with aberrancy. Now most commonly this phenomenon is seen in cases of atrial fibrillation or those who have many frequent atrial premature complexes then when you get complexes which are extremely premature that's when you get this phenomenon. Now what happens in this? We have to know that the right bundle has a longer refractory period than the left bundle. This is a normal characteristic phenomenon which is seen at rest. Now when you have a long RR interval and what do I mean by RR interval is when the duration between two consecutive QRS complexes that is the RR interval when it is long that gives a chance for this right bundles or even the left bundles in some cases but usually the right bundle it gives a chance for this bundle to further prolong its refractory period so it is at rest it's it's generally allowed to rest as much as possible with this even longer RR interval now what happens in next is the next beat after this long RR interval if it happens to be short or if the next QRS complex happens to be early then that beat starts becoming aberrant and usually the aberrancy is in the form of a right bundle branch 
aberrancy here you can see v1 and you have a right bundle branch type of aberrancy and this is ashman's phenomenon which is aberrancy occurring after a long short qrs sequence here is a long sequence and a short sequence and after which aberrancy sets in for a few beats here you can see that this is a baseline ecg of atrial fibrillation most of the complexes here are narrow only when this sequence has occurred that is a long and a short sequence it has set up these four beats of wide complex tachycardia so this is important to know because one might think that oh there is a run of non sustained vt but this is not non sustained vt this is in fact ashman's phenomenon so whenever you have an ecg of wide complex tachycardia here are the 10 questions that would be the best to ask and that would cover pretty much everything that you are trying to look for in an ecg and in that patient who's suffering with wide complex tachycardia so in this video we'll be dealing with only the first three questions and in the next one we'll be dealing mainly with the morphological criteria of vt versus svt remember there's also a clinical criteria where you look for the blood pressure and canon waves and looking at the blood pressure obviously comes first but just to follow a sequence the first question that you'll ask is is it really wide complex you have to check the qrs duration is it regular or irregular because we've seen earlier when there is irregularity a lot of irregularity because of atrial fibrillation you have to make sure it's not atrial fibrillation with pre excitation for which you need to directly cardioward the patient because it's a emergency and third look at the p waves and qrs relationship this is very important because you want to establish that there is a lack of relationship between the two to call it a ventricular tachycardia you have to look for av dissociation you have to check for the number of p waves and qrs complexes and you can see whether you can march the p waves through qrs complexes so the first question you ask is confirm is it really wide complex tachycardia right so you have to choose any lead which has the widest qrs duration and it is called wide qrs when the duration is more than 120 milliseconds that is fine but can vt ventricular tachycardia occur as a narrow qrs tachycardia and it can happen number 1 when you have a baseline qrs or a baseline ecg which is wide then vts occur when there are runs of narrow complexes so that is when the vt can be narrow and second is when the origin of the ventricular tachycardia is close to the septum near the his bundle then the duration of the qrs will not be as wide as you expected it expect it to be and in fact it will be between 110 to 120 milliseconds once you have confirmed that it is a wide complex tachycardia you have to make sure whether it is regular or irregular now vt is usually regular but wide complex tachycardia with an irregular rhythm is always because of the presence of atrial fibrillation and that can be because of atrial fibrillation with aberrancy with which we which we saw earlier or atrial fibrillation with pre excitation and remember atrial fibrillation with pre excitation and i reiterate again is a dangerous condition you have to cardioward these patients because they come with something known as fast broad and irregular right f b i they come with a fast rhythm which is broad leading to wide complex tachycardia and irregular so when you have an f b i you have to call your f b i and cardioward the patient of course when you have the beginning of a vt you can have some slight irregular rhythm which which is seen because this vt suddenly just set in motion it takes some time for it to stabilize but when you have a very obvious irregularity that is because of atrial fibrillation now once you have established that the tachycardia is wide and regular now you have to look for the p waves and qrs and see if you can find any evidence of av dissociation you have to check the number of p waves and the qrs complexes and you can see if you can match the p waves through the qrs complexes
Now, first off, the P waves are best seen in lead 2. When P waves occur and when they get buried, they occur as notches or deflections over the STT segments when they are buried inside these STT segments. The important thing to know is that P waves have a consistent morphology and timing and are regularly paced, which means that you can march them out through the QRS complexes and I'll show you how in just a minute. Now, when you have the number of QRS complexes which are greater than the number of P waves, then unequivocally, this is a ventricular tachycardia. But there are certain cases when you may not get this combination of QRS being greater than P waves, that is when you have a slow VT, usually with rates of less than 170 beats per minute, that's when you get a 1 is to 1 association of P to QRS complexes. And why does that happen? Is because you get a retrograde VA conduction, that is a retrograde ventricle to atrial conduction because of this slow rate and you get P waves after each QRS complexes. So here the number of QRS and P waves are equal to each other but still it is a VT although it is a slow ventricular tachycardia. Now let's march the P waves through the QRS complexes. Now here you have sinus beats. This is PQRS, 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 right? another PQRS and then you have this little strip of wide complex tachycardia. Now, you can't obviously, direct, you cannot directly say that this is ventricular tachycardia. You have to still keep a certain element of doubt in your head and consider two differential diagnoses. Number one, it could be a ventricular tachycardia or number two, it could be because of a premature atrial beat or a premature P wave with aberrant conduction that is also possible but we know that this is not a premature p wave with aberrant conduction because after this pqrs complex the first complex you get is this ventricular beat you do not get a premature p wave right now when you try to see if you can check out for any p waves within this complex then you will notice that there is one deflection here there's another deflection here. There's a possibility of a deflection here. We don't know. And there is definitely one deflection here, which is caused this little bump over this QRS complex. So here, if you try to match out your P waves, you'll see that this difference or this distance between each consecutive P waves is remaining constant. Here, it is buried inside this QRS complex. So you can't find out where this P wave is but you assume it to be here but the timing is remaining constant and you can march it out to this P wave this is definitely a P wave so this is how you march out P waves through the QRS complexes that means the P waves are beating at their own beat at their own sweet time which is already fixed and the ventricular arrhythmia has set in and it, ha it has superimposed itself over this beating P waves. And this is the meaning of AV dissociation. And the number of QRS complexes that we see here, which are inscribed on this ECG, are more than the number of P waves that you see. Most of them are buried, but the ones which you actually see are less. And so you have a case of ventricular tachycardia. Now we'll come to another manifestation of AV dissociation or atrioventricular dissociation known as fusion beats and capture beats. Now first let's come to capture beats also known as Dressler's beats. Now in this impulses originate in the sinus node and they conduct down the AV node and this impulse captures the ventricles instead of allowing this ventricular tachycardia focus to capture the ventricles. And the morphology of this beat has the, is the same as that of the baseline sinus beat. So when suddenly one impulse comes from the sinus node and overpowers the VT focus, then you get a capture or a Dressler's beat. Then you have a fusion beat in which an impulse has come down from the 
SA node and it partially captures the ventricle but at the same time the ventricular tachycardia focus also is partially capturing the rest of the ventricle so you get something known as a fusion complex with a morphology which is intermediate between the sinus beat and the ventricular tachycardia beat so this is how it will look you have a ventricular tachycardia beat here and then you have these two different complexes so obviously this is a capture beat it it looks like a pretty normal beat just how you would expect in a normal sinus baseline rhythm and this is a fusion beat which points to an intermediate morphology between the sinus beat and the vt beat okay so now let's try to uh, practice approaching a case of wide complex tachycardia using the first three questions that we have learned so far and then we can go ahead with the rest in the next video so the first question is is it really wide so you look at the um, l widest complex on the ecg and it's certainly wide it's more than 120 milliseconds so that is fine is it regular or irregular so it is largely a regular tachycardia right so this is a wide regular tachycardia now i admit that this is not as wide as it is usually seen but the reason for this could be that this ventricular tachycardia focus is closer to the high septum closer to the hispurkinji bundle and that's when the wideness is not that pronounced now let's look at the p and qrs relationship which is what is important here so here you can make out that there are intermittent p waves as shown by these arrows so we can make out these p waves and that some of them are here as well and the number of qrs complexes is more than the number of p waves second another important thing that i had mentioned is that there are subtle differences in the qrs and stt waves when you have ventricular tachycardia because the focus is from the ventricular myocardium and there are differential activation and repolarization properties of the myocardium and so every complex will not be very similar to the earlier complex there will be certain changes so this is what is exemplified by these blue arrows here you can see that some of them are having deep t inversions some of them are not having deep t inversions so there are some changes in the sct waves and also here you can see that the qrs complex this complex is smaller this is larger this is again smaller so there are subtle differences between them one of the reasons of course can be that if you have hidden p waves inside these complexes then also the morphology changes but generally even without the hidden p waves the subtle differences between the complexes remain so based on these three questions this is certainly going towards ventricular tachycardia another significant finding in this ecg is the fact that there is this single beat of narrow complex within the sea of relatively broader complexes and this is what i had mentioned before called the capture beat or dressler's beat and the presence of this beat points to the fact that there is av dissociation which means that there is ventricular tachycardia let's come to another practice ecg and try to tackle this based on the first three questions that we've learned so far now is this tachycardia really wide for sure this is wide the duration looks to be more than five small squares so it is more than 200 milliseconds of duration the rate is not that high though it is between 130 to 140 beats per minute is it regular or irregular it is certainly regular and what about the p waves versus the qrs now admittedly i don't see too many p waves here now you might think that this could be a p wave which could possibly make it a p wave these complexes do look like p waves but they are not one may erroneously think that these are p waves but one way to confirm whether they are p waves or not is to con is to compare them with another lead for example if you compare this v2 lead 
which contains these bizarre complexes with V1, you see that these complexes, this small little notch, lies within the duration of this QRS. So it looks to be to be a part of this QRS complex. So those are not really P waves. Otherwise, you might think that this is PQRS, PQRS, which is not the case, right? So it's it's wide, it's regular. There's a questionable P wave here. Uh, and another important finding is that there are these subtle differences between the various QRS complex morphology, right? Uh, otherwise, you don't see any evidence of AV dissociation, which we saw in the past ECG. But overall, as per the first three questions, it does seem to be highly a case of ventricular tachycardia. Now, how do you differentiate the QRS morphology of ventricular tachycardia versus that of a bundle branch block? There are various morphological criteria for which you'll have to watch part two of the video series on this approach to wide complex tachycardia. So as always, like, share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon. And I'll see you next time with another video.